Over a hundred years of searches by dozens of teams have all failed to find it. But now let's go back to see what happened in the wake of Michelson and Morley's 1887 null result. In 1905, Einstein cut through the difficulty when he published his paper on the electrodynamics of moving bodies. Einstein looked carefully at all electromagnetic interactions and noted how some effects were measured depended only on the relative motion of the objects in question. In so doing, he revived and extended Galilean relativity. Take, for example, a permanent magnet and a conducting metal object. Let's take our magnet and move it past the conducting metal object. Here, the motion of the magnet creates an electric field that induces a current in the conductor. Now, if we instead keep the magnet at rest and move the conductor, the moving conductor will then experience a force called an electromotive force, or EMF, that generates a current, but no electric field was created in the vicinity of the stationary magnet. These two effects were always seen as two different phenomena and treated differently with different equations and different names. But Einstein came along and said that the actual observable effect, the generation of a current, does not depend on which object, either the magnet or the conductor, is in motion, but only on their relative motion. To reiterate, in the case of the moving magnet and the stationary conductor, the movement of the magnet creates an electric field around it, which in turn generates a current of the conductor. On the other hand, in the case of the conductor moving and the stationary magnet, although no electric field is generated in this case, the movement of the conductor through the magnetic field produces an electromotive force, which again results in a current. Einstein's key insight was that the relative motion between the conductor and the magnet produces the same physical effect, an electric current, in both cases, even though the mechanisms are described in different ways. This was an extension of Galileo's boat on a glassy sea. Galileo only considered the relativity of events happening on the boat and being unable to distinguish the boat's constant speed motion from tests done down in the windowless hold. Einstein basically added the idea that if two ships passed each other, each with their own experiments on board their boats, and one boat had a magnet and the other had a conductor, the bosun below decks watching the conductor would know that he was moving with respect to the other boat that had the magnet if he measured a current through the conductor, but he wouldn't again be able to tell if it were his boat that were moving with respect to the shore, or if he were at anchor and the other boat was sailing by. This elevated Galilean relativity up to a new height. As Einstein wrote in 1905, quote, together with the unsuccessful attempts to discover any motion of the Earth relatively to the light medium, suggest that the phenomena of electrodynamics as well as of mechanics possess no properties corresponding to the idea of absolute rest. They suggest rather that the same laws of electrodynamics and optics will be valid for all frames of reference for which the equations of mechanics hold good. He called this his first postulate of relativity. All physical laws are valid for all inertial frames, no matter their relative motion. His second postulate is the one that triggers so many Doc Brown wannabes into trying to trick out a DeLorean in their garages and their dilapidated ranch houses deep in the woods. Einstein stated that light is always propagated in empty space with a definite velocity c, which is independent of the state of motion of the emitting body. He goes on to completely adopt the null results of the Michelson-Morley experiment and all its antecedents. Quote, the introduction of a luminiferous ether will prove to be superfluous as the view here to be developed will not require an absolutely stationary space provided with special properties, nor sign a velocity vector to a point of the empty space in which the electromagnetic processes take place. This is the core of special relativity. He chose to toss out Newton's concepts of absolute space and absolute time. He chose to throw out your common sense. Making this statement is nothing short of revolutionary. Let's look at some implications for these two postulates. For the first postulate, the laws of physics are the same for all uniformly moving observers, no matter what the speed of the observer is going. Here, uniformly always means with a constant velocity. That is, no acceleration, no turning, no speeding up or slowing down. No such thing as absolute rest, which means that there is no such thing as absolute speed, only relative speed. 
any uniformly moving observer can also consider themselves at rest. Every observer also only sees their own time and space as normal. Every possible physical experiment is the same, no matter what your speed is. And here's what happens with the second postulate, that the speed of light in a vacuum is the same for all observers, regardless of their motion relative to the source of the light. This has a lot of implications. The first is, the speed of light is a universal constant. We cannot send or receive information faster than the speed of light. And the speed of light does not add or subtract to or from the relative motion of the observer. This has been experimentally verified in all cases. I'll give you the most important punchline here of all. Because of these strange implications, these postulates have been challenged and tested harder than any theory in the history of science. But the degree to which we now trust them has resulted in the odd fact that we no longer measure the speed of light. We define it. In 1983, the International Bureau for Weights and Measures, the international organization responsible for preserving and promulgating scientific measuring standards, held their quadrennial general conference. Prior to 1983, the concepts of space and time were separate. The meter was defined for a long time by the distance between two ticks on a platinum meridian bar at the Bureau in Sevres, France. In 1960, the meter was subsequently redefined to be a large number of wavelengths of light from an atomic transition in Krypton-86. As for time, the second had been defined as the duration of a gargantuan number of vibrations found in an atomic hyperfine ground state transition of cesium-133. The attendees of the 1983 conference then chose to elevate Einstein's postulate to the level of settled science by defining the speed of light to be exactly 299,792,458 meters per second. This definition then removed the need for the standard meter bar, and now it stands as a museum backup piece. Henceforth, the speed of light was then to be recognized and understood as a fundamental universal constant. Interestingly, this basically turned it into a simple conversion factor between space and time, which were now seen to be aspects of, of the same entity, space-time. Einstein's postulates have withstood withering experimental challenges because his assertion that there is no medium for light waves properties combined with the erasure of absolute space and time caused legitimate scientific consternation. Let's now look at the underpinning mathematics that Einstein used to describe his special theory of relativity. 